You're listening to The Secret to My Success, an interview style podcast that asks our guests what trait, skill, or characteristic they possess that's made them a success. Hosted by Shelby Skirhawk. On today's episode, we're going to do things a little bit different. We're talking to Donald Kelly, who calls himself the sales evangelist. And it's interesting that we have him on this week's episode because he is teaching something I need help with. He's got a podcast by the same name, and he says that there are three things. You need three things, basically, to be a good salesman. Now, I preface salesman because I've said this before. Nobody thinks they're a salesman until they're out in this gig economy and trying to do things on their own. And they realize the only way people are going to hear about you and and want to use your services, your podcast, your writing, anything like that, is you're going to have to sell yourself. So he says you need three things, the desire, the hustle factor, and proper training. Now, I've got the desire. I want this podcast to succeed. I think I've got the hustle factor. I think just the mere fact of how this came about, how I was pushed out of the nest, so to speak, um, when Success Magazine laid off its editorial staff. And instead of going right back into another safe editorial job, I broke out on my own and tried to forge this new thing by myself. But I don't have the number three thing that he says I need, and that's proper training. So Donald talks about all of the uh, basic formulas that that exist for being able to make a sale, but I'm going to use some of his training right off the bat by um, mentioning two people that are very special to the show. So I had sent out an email a couple weeks ago, uh, basically asking some of my um, most frequent email subscribers, I guess the ones that are most active, if they would do me a favor and rate the show for me um, on iTunes. Basically, I said that, you know, there are 550,000 shows in Apple podcasts. And so an independent podcast like mine, I mean, those are crowded waters to compete in. So that's why I reached out to uh, to just a few of y'all to help me out, if you will. And that's the thing, though, is that I, I feel I shouldn't feel like I'm imposing on on asking somebody for feedback because that's how we all get better is with feedback. But um, I'm stepping out of my comfort zone and um, I'm going to sell the show a little bit. So I want to thank those uh, those two individuals that were gracious enough to leave me a a review and uh, and share that with me. So one of those individuals is a gentleman by the name of Dan Wolf. He said, so glad Shelby has her own podcast. She does a fantastic job interviewing her guests, and I look forward to more of them. Dan, thank you for those very kind words. The other person I have to thank is John Daly. His review says, I used to listen to Shelby while at her prior position. Now that she's on her own, I can say unequivocally that this podcast is far better. Her interviewing skills are fantastic, and there's a genuineness to her voice. If you aren't listening to every podcast of The Secret to My Success, you're missing out. Thank you. Thank you for that, because that is the the food and the nourishment that I need to, to keep creating these. With those two thank yous said, I humbly ask if you would consider leaving a five-star rating and review of the show. Also, If you've got a friend who loves podcasts and who loves self-improvement and personal development content like this, let them know about the show. Uh, You know, go steal their phone and subscribe to The Secret to My Success on on their podcast app and let them hear it. And hopefully they're going to find some value of it because the thing that I learned from Donald Kelly, who is our guest today, He says that basically, you're not trying to just sell a widget when you're selling. You're basically sharing something that you really believe somebody could use. So if you know somebody that could use this podcast, I would love it if you would share that with them. And without further ado, let's hear what Donald has to say. Donald, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Shelby. I am stoked to be here. 
Excellent. So I want to uh, give the audience a little bit of a, a primer on on your life because you have been in the podcast game for for a while, but it, it wasn't certainly an overnight success. You know, there was there was work that that was involved in the process. Uh, tell me a little bit about your podcast. Well, uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a hustle. I feel like uh, an old man in the world of podcasting. <laughs> I've been doing it about five years now. But our podcast is designed for new and struggling salespeople. Um, we, we designed this because I was a new seller that was having a really difficult time like most uh, salespeople when I first get into the game. And we didn't necessarily know how I was going to be, you know get success and um, in, in my new job as a seller. And I was having a really difficult time and I had to borrow money from my mom. But it came to a point at where my um, my company put me into a sales training program and it was absolutely fantastic. It revolutionized the way I sold. Um, and I started actually selling, I guess. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, from that, I was like, man, there are many, many people out there probably running in the same struggles that I had where they don't know how to um, how, how to bring value to the table. Right. Um, so. It was a hockey stick in my performance with my sales. So I started to talk about that and one thing led to another. And it was a selfish purpose as well. I'm not going to lie where I would um, do the podcast and I would start learning from some of these uh, individuals that I interviewed and it made me that much better of a seller. So right. it, it was a win-win all around. Absolutely. So, I mean, you were interviewing the people that that were really kind of setting the trend and setting the strategy for best practices. What was the uh, training that uh, that you partook in right off the bat that really made a difference? The biggest, the, the first one was Sandler, um, Sandler Sales Training Org uh, Group. Um, we went through a six week program, and then I went into their President's Club, where I met for a, a, each week with a group of sellers and a sales trainer for about two hours. Um, for 12 months and imagine what that could do for you. It, the, the sales training alone, the first part was, was just amazing. It's yeah. fundamental blocks and tackle basic, but it, it was great. And that's where I came to realize the fundamentals, what truly um, have deep impact. And I build off of that over the years, but that was the, that was, if I was making a barbecue sauce, that was the ketchup. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was the base. So obviously you understood the uh, the importance of training. Was it your idea to initiate the training or uh, or the position that you're in, they suggested that you take it? The the company um, offered training, which was which was great because most companies, they don't want to invest the time and right, money into right. that, right? They want to they just want to say, you come in, do what you can and, and you know, wham, bam, and then let's go from there. Um, and that was is a smart thing and something that I learned that I need to do. So when I first uh, went on my own and created my own organization, I made sure. And fortunately, I know a great sales training organization myself. So <laughs> we make sure we train our people. And uh, the companies that when sales sellers ask me, you know, should I take this job? I find help them find out, is this a place that will give you the proper training you need to succeed or you have to reinvent it? And I always recommend find somebody that can train you because it's why reinvent the wheel every time around. Exactly. I mean, that's the whole premise of, of personal development really is, yes, you're improving yourself, but you're not having to start all over again every time that you set out to do something. So you learn from other people's mistakes and you study the people that are successful and, and kind of learn the traits that that they've used to become a success. And, and I guess that's um, that loops well into our, our theme today, because that's certainly the theme of, of this show. Um, I want to go back to your childhood. So you were growing up in Jamaica. Tell me a little bit about just your 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 childhood situation, your parents, and uh, what kind of kid you were. <laughs> um, I was mischievous. <laughs> uh, I was uh, almost. I wasn't as quiet as Huck Finn, but I, I think I was. Uh, I, I gave him a good ri uh, run for his dollar. Hmm. But um, growing up in Jamaica, there you know, it was just always like a little adventure. Um, my family, like if anyone has been to Jamaica, you know, like. Jamaicans are just hustlers mm -hmm. and anyone knows any Jamaican, you know, they probably have two jobs and that's just something that it's a, in the staple in our DNA. It's like just work and you, you hustle. Yeah. Um, so my, my mom moved to the United States when, uh, when I was six and then I, I came over when I was nine, um, full time. Well, I came and visit when I was six, but then I went back and lived with my family, my aunt. 
and then moved back when I moved when I was nine. And um, the the reason being, she was establishing an opportunity for us here. Like any immigrant parent, you you have to sacrifice and and do a lot, and and that's what we did. And but while I was in Jamaica throughout that time, it gave me the sense of making things happen, mm-hmm. figuring out a way to make things happen. And I remember uh, my mom would send like you know money and things like that. But you know for the day to day stuff, I saw my aunt. She hustled, and uh, my my dad, my parents separated when I was younger, but I still had relationships with them. And I saw how he had a little business, and he hustled. So in my mind, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to create a little business. So I used to get cookies and uh, put them in little baggies and sell them in a the front yard, <laughs> or get mangoes from the tree and you know try to sell them. My wife and I went back recently to and our family to a, like a little family gathering in Jamaica that last Christmas, mm-hmm. and I saw the little thing. Um, it was like a like a gardening uh, plant holder thingy. Mm-hmm that was uh put together and uh that was my table and i remember (laughs) using that uh, i took a picture with it my wife uh um took of it of me but it was uh my little table stand and i put a cardboard or whatever on top a piece of wood to have my products on but it was fun and and that's that's the hustle that was a birth of it when i first started to try to sell um, and saw that I could do that. It, it it gave me an excitement. And the other thing too, I our family had a little shop, and uh, actually we had I think we had uh, partnered with a, a friend, and he was the owner of the shop now. But it was adjacent to our house, like literally built on the house. And uh, I would work in a shop sometime, and you know my role was to collect money and and sell products like if the the shopkeeper had to leave Mm -hmm. and i was like a six seven you know eight year old doing this stuff and it was you you learn at a young age about that idea of money like people want product and you get money for said product and that was cool so i figured if i did that there i could do it on my own so this entrepreneurial spirit came from many different aspects in jamaica you don't you can't you don't graduate uh, your high school and then go to college and then graduate college and then all of a sudden you have a nice cushy job the middle class is non-existent pretty mm-hmm. much you have the upper class and then you have a major major um you know a poor class so you have to find creative ways to to generate opportunities um so that that gave me that feel that's how i could generate some some little quick wins and and stuff and it, it it was fun and it still is. So that was my birth into sales as a young kid. Yeah. The, I'm curious when you're, you're growing up into it, that gives you an advantage uh, because it's kind of ingrained in your mind that this, this desire, this passion, this, this hustle, as you described it. But was there a point in time where you felt kind of outmatched in terms of, of salesmanship? I mean, it's, there's a lot that can be kind of natural to somebody, but when it comes down to the the brass tacks of uh, how to close a sale or how to how to approach people without kind of turning them off, I mean, it, it seems like that's something that has to be learned. It doesn't come naturally. So, I guess at what point did you really start to become a a student of sales? When uh, when I met with Master Yoshi, I'm saying no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, it probably would be in, in middle school. Let me explain first. There was a kid named Dixon. Um, he was a rival, but a different industry in mm-hmm. high in middle school. <laughs> I sold uh, candy. He sold cookies. Oh, okay. Um, he, he would buy this like uh, this uh, Hispanic cookie. Um, and uh, it was like a cracker almost, but people loved it. And I sold like, uh, you know, Snicker bars and things like that. And sometimes he would outsell me. He would have a lot of people buying stuff from him. And I was like, man, what is it that, you know, that's, you know, that makes a difference. I thought I was a good seller. I thought, you know, I, I grew up, you know, my family selling. Yeah. But sometimes he started to realize that it's you give people what they want. What was the, you know, people wanted to get some, you know, sustenance. They didn't only want candy. So that, that was a, a mere glimpse. But later on in a professional world, I did. Um, I sold for a company called Comtech. They're no longer around, but Comtech did um, IT training classes around the early 2007, 2008 time period. Comtech was uh, um, a lot of people were doing these classes like MCSC, NetPlus. And my job was to sell seats into those classes. Um, and there were people that were 
um, clearly better than I was and, and got to get a chance and watching them and seeing how they did things. How were they able to just talk to people and guide them uh, across the, the finish line more, you know, way better than I could do it. So I started learning from uh, one of the guys uh, there. Um, Steve Hatch was the owner of the organization and, you know, other guys were uh, Johnny Lee. Uh, literally, that's what his name, John <laughs> Lee. So I would learn from him. Um, and I, I started just watching what people were doing. But these were a lot of them were B to C, these experiences. And then when I really started to learn B to C, like really started textbook learning was um, I started reading uh, my, my best friend's dad. Uh, he introduced me to the book Think and Grow yeah. Rich. That was my first sales marketing business book ever. And I, um, not necessarily marketing, but it was, it gave me a, a good leg up and it gave me the motivation and aspiration as a self-help kind of a arena. And then I went to do door-to-door security sales. And that, that's where I realized sales was truly a science because you, your job was to sell a security system to someone who did not wake up this mm-hmm. morning thinking they needed a security system in 45 minutes of knocking on their door. Right. And that's what we did. And um, it was, there was a process, there were steps, there were things you say, because I thought, no, you could just go out there and do it. But I'm like, why would they spend all this money to develop this video that trained you? And they walked you through like for a whole 45 minutes, that whole process. And I'm like, this is not, this is baloney. That doesn't work. That's not what really is you know, you know, easy, that's what, what it is. You just get out there, you just talk and you finesse. But there is a process and there's a recipe. Just like you can't go and try to bake a bread by just thinking, well, it's just flour and salt and water and stuff. Let me just throw it together, right. maybe some yeast. You do it at the right time and the right moment and the right word and the right phraseology. And uh, that was all B to C. So those were the experiences from middle school up to college when I did door-to-door security sales. Translating that into the B to B world, that's where I had the difficulty and I had to relearn. Um, and that's when I went through the Sandler stuff. Well, so it, it occurs to me then when when you say that sales really is a science, I think for people that are that can, don't consider themselves salespeople, I mean, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I, when it would come to, you know, promoting this podcast or or maybe promoting my, my work as a freelance writer, I'm always the first person to to self doubt and negative thought. Just let those things take over and not let the message shine through. And so I always thought, okay, well, I'm just not a salesperson. But <laughs> it's encouraging to hear you say though that it's a science because that implies that it's learnable. That it doesn't have to be an instinctive thing that you're just born with. That you can follow steps just like a recipe that that you're baking. Now I'm not a great baker either, but at least I understand that you know when you put this, 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 and this together in this particular order, you should get something that looks like this. Is is that something that a, a lot of people don't realize that there is a science to it, so it can be learned and 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 mastered? Yeah, let, let me turn this back on you for a second before I answer that. Why did you think before you started um, doing, uh, I guess, you know, selling yourself or, or selling mm-hmm. in general? Why did you think that it was someone had to have quote unquote the gift of gab? If, if I'm putting yeah, words no, there. that's that's a good question. I think. I was confident in my ability to uh, to gab in terms of the content, the stuff, I guess, that I was selling, because uh, I knew that was good content. But as far as me being able to to sell somebody on that I was the person to do it, I guess I just I, I I've always kind of had this uh, separation of church and state, just based on my my newspaper background. That editorial is editorial, and sales is sales. And so I never really understood or I never really adopted like I should have the idea of content marketing and being able to give information and and sell something that or basically sell information, give the reader more information that they're looking for. I was slow to that. So I thought it had to be something that you're just kind of born with. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned there is, you know, it 
some people think that we it it has to be a a a, a born with a, a thing because it's they're different species, different uh, you know people. They're salespeople. They're weird. <laughs> um, and a lot of it comes from, I think, pop culture who defines selling. If you look at any, you know, from your early childhood or early time, when you think of a salesperson as somebody that's really eloquent with their speaking or slick with their talk or just knew how to persuade, they were uh, convincing or in some case, um, uh, almost like a mm-hmm. trickster in a way where they came off winning. Like think about any movie. I don't love putting this one on the, the the pulpit a lot, like you know Wolf of yeah. Wall Street or um, you know any of those type of uh, movies. The the thing that make them so well is because of the drama, and that's what sells. That's a sizzle. But sometimes if you try to make a movie about a, a good salesperson who helps the buyer and walks them through, it's going to be a boring <laughs> right. movie. So right. we get this idea that you have to be. Uh, you know, convince. I mean, it has to be something that comes natural. And oftentimes, too, when it's something that we don't necessarily know, we see it as there has to be a, there's a, some kind of magic exactly. behind that. If that person can pl- catch a football and run that fast, he must have been born that way because clearly I am not athletic, so I can't do it like that. He must have been given some God-given ability. But if you don't see the hours and hours and hours of that person, I ran, I think it was uh, Jerry Rice used to catch bricks Wow! <laughs> because it was, a, you know, it was a, it, 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 he wanted to make sure that he was perfect. And that's why he went down the Hall of Fame. He was, he was, he practiced that. So when it comes to sales, it's the same exact thing because it's foreign to us. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it has to be magical. Um, it means that it's, there's a process behind it. So with sales, in, if you look at sales in the same vein or the same light, there, when I first got into my role, I had the same stigma or idea that this person was a, a born mm-hmm. seller and they were a trickster. You, you were going to win. The buyer was going to lose. That's how it is. Um, and I, you had to be beautiful or you had to look a, very handsome and have the most expensive suit and nice cars and play golf and all of that. But it wasn't the truth. My One of the best salesperson I ever met, name was uh, Lori, and she was a sales manager and she was not the beautiful blonde, did not wear the skimpy clothes, and she did not have like this... Uh, this facade, like I thought that if you're a female seller, you're going to have, or if you're a male seller, right. you're going to have just pe- people didn't fit that mold, but she was killing it. And it came to realize that it was a process. And once I started going through the training, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Oz is not that big and mighty. Right. As I thought, once I saw behind the curtain, Oz was just anyone that understood that you give people what they want, that people tend to have challenges. You have solution articulate that solution to said problem in the form of question, listen to people, and they will tell you more than likely between the lines how they buy and how you should sell that product to them. Um, so there, there's literally a science behind it. I knew there was a step, like, you know, you introduce the challenge, introduce, find out the problem, find out, you know, qualify. It's, this I'm saying is really basic. So any seller is going to be like, it's not that simple, but it's basically sure. this. You find problem uh, or find a prospect, you qualify them by expressing the problem and you know, sharing your solution. Then you get the right team members together. Who's how they're going to make the decision on this? You do a demonstration of the said solution, whether it's a software or a service that you have to offer, or if it's a writing service. And then you propose uh, how the investment. And then you walk through that investment proposal with them, and then you invite them at the end to change. Um, throughout the whole process, you invite them to change or to make a make the move. And then in a, essentially, if you walk through those steps and did everything, they all did different activities and processes in each of those steps, which we don't have time to go through, you realize, hey, Mighty Oz isn't as mighty as I thought he was right. or she was. It's a step. I love that you mention Oz because um, that's <laughs> that's something that I, I touch on a lot. Um, I, I've had this column that I've been working on for, for months because I can't quite get to the point that I want to make. But I, I talk about this, uh, gosh, I think it's the band America. And they have a, a line that says, Oz did never, never gave nothing to the Tin Man that he didn't already have. And I think that's just such a powerful idea that we go in our lives thinking that that 
things have to be given to us, that that talent has to be given to us, our luck has to be given to us, when more often than not, it's been there all along. And it's just a matter of, of seeing it and being able to, to realize it. And I think that comes from a place of confidence or lack of not being able to see it. So uh, tell me a little bit about um, how the unconfident person, the person that doesn't believe that, um, that they have what it takes to be a great salesman, how can they kind of sell themselves on believing they can do this? So, you know, great point on that. Um, I will I'll answer that. I just wanted to share a thought to one of the first sales managers I had. He said that luck is nothing more than when hard work meet an opportunity. Yeah. Um, and I was like, man, holy moly. And that's what he pushed out on how you can get lucky. So the, the salesperson that doesn't have the confidence in his or her ability or have to sell themselves on on that, how do you how do you uh, help them or how do they do that? Well, it comes down to this. Um, if the first person you do have to sell is yourself, um, and we I think we established that you you do, no matter what you do, you do have to believe that you that you can and you will do it. Um, you, you you truly have to have that that confidence because it's going to prospect will pick up on that like Doberman. They're going to say, well, you know. Clearly, she or he doesn't believe in their stuff. Why should I believe in it? People oftentimes make bets on someone or a company because mm-hmm. of the seller's confidence in that solution. This The salesperson, if you're working for someone else, if you're working for an established firm, my recommendation is you go to the customers and you ask them, why did they mm-hmm. buy from the organization? Because that's going to give you something. And that's why you you see in churches, they have like a, um, testimonial meetings because it, 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 it builds someone's faith when you can hear someone else have gone through that. It's also the same thing you see within like, you know, AA or, you know, an athletic, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sports games. People will talk about the wins and the excitement and coach pump people up because there's something about being around other people who have done it that gives you that confidence. If you're doing it for yourself, Find others who are doing it as well or others who, if you're, you know, a great way, someone, a great yeah. way you can learn is from your competition. So let's say if I'm a, um, I, I'm a solo practitioner, um, say I'm a ghostwriter, just throw that out there. Uh, I'm a ghostwriter and, you know, say in a situation, mm-hmm. I don't know if you ghostwrite, but you're writing for someone and you have competitions, other people out there. You go to the competition and you see if, who are the, some of their customers. Look at their testimonials. See why others are confident in writing in yeah. in a hiring a ghostwriter. And then once you can see that others have done it and others are willing to invest in it, it's like, what the heck? Let me try it. But you have to overcome that hurdle believing that you, you can do it. Because if you can't sell yourself, you can never guide someone down a process. The confidence must be there. So learning from others, learning from your competition through their client testimonials, and that can help you to see that others are willing to spend the money. And I'll give you one last thing for this. I wasn't confident when I when I left my full time software gig. It was a challenge for me because I've never sold Donald Kelly in a loan. I've sold Donald Kelly in conjunction with yeah. a you know a software license to you know the the, the company that I sold. But when I was selling just me to do a speaking or a coaching or training it was it was nerve-wracking but i had to i I learned from others who were doing the same thing i was doing and they said you know yeah people are willing to pay for that and you are undervaluing yourself you need to charge more or you need to ask for this or people are willing to do this and the first speaking gig that i had it was uh, a friend of mine worked at a college and he had me come out and do like an inspirational speaking to students who were uh, Mm -hmm. from uh, situations I was from, you know, first gen background where, you know, parents didn't really go to college um, or first one in your family to go to college. So I, I did, I did that. And here's the interesting thing about it. It was like uh, coming out to California from Florida. If you ever did that, that that plane ticket alone is like, you know, maybe like 400 yeah. bucks in, in itself. And then um, luckily I stayed with him, but the cost of renting a car and I had to drive from L.A. to San Luis Obispo, 
next thing you know, that was flush. Um, it was like 500. Um, and that, that's what I thought I could do. And I was so excited. $1,000 was way out of the ballpark. I'm not worth $1,000. Um, but my wife, she's very, very, uh, she's a good seller, yeah. but she doesn't realize it. She doesn't like sales per se. But she was like, you are worth more than that. And sometimes others can see our worth and say, you need to ask for more. So one of the, the next uh, gigs, they referred me to another organization. And that organization was for three hours of speaking, three different speaking occasions. Hmm. Guess how much I asked for? Ah, uh, taking a guess. Well, sir, uh, three thousand. Double that. Wow. I, I almost tripled that. I asked for about, uh, I think it was seventy-five to eight, eighty-five hundred. I think was the final yeah. price that I got, and it was amazing. And they said yes, and it was. I had to overcome myself that Donald was capable of doing yeah. that, and it wasn't highway robbery because they knew that I had to put time into preparing the speeches. I knew I had to put hours of, uh, you know, of travel and I had several days that I had to travel. So it's three different occasion to California and the airline ticket. And um, in this case, I was paying for my hotels and, and so forth. So they understood that value. And I'm sure if I had said 10 K, they probably would have said yes to that as well. But it comes down. Do you believe, do you think that you have value in mm -hmm. it? And if you don't get family members or to, to help you with that and, you know, always use your mm -hmm. competition to get some of their client uh, testimonials to give you inspiration that people are willing to do that. I hope that makes sense. It was a long. Yeah, time. no. And that's, I've got to say that uh, that hits me right on the head because that's that, you know, that's my backstory is that I've never done this on my own. I was always corporate. And so I was, you know, Shelby Skirhawk with Success Magazine, not Shelby. Shelby Skirhawk with Shelby Skirhawk. And, and so the, the, I guess the fear that, that I have, and I know a lot of people who are podcasters or independent uh, freelance writers, I guess the fear is that you're putting yourself out there, that there's nothing else between you and, and the audience and that somehow you're going to come up short. So what are, I guess, what are those, those things that you tell yourself that, uh, when you, when those doubts start to creep in, that you are worth this, that you do have a good product in you, in your information, in your expertise. And uh, I guess how often now do you have to remind yourself of that? If, if ever. Every day. Um, not gonna lie. Yeah. Every day, every day, I still battle it. Um, like I look back and I I see where we are. So, to put things in context. When I first launched a podcast, um, we had uh, you know getting like ten people to listen to it. Or I remember the first day I was like had like thirty downloads, yeah. and I was like, no way, <laughs> this is so cool. And you know, I was like, those are thirty. Say if it's you know if it was family or friends. Say, let's say fifteen people that really found impact from the show and and that was great and not making any money from it was just fun you know it's just doing it and it's something that i kept doing because it was fun and i always said the, the moment podcasting becomes not fun that's the day i will stop doing it um but then it grew and to like last month we hit a hundred thousand downloads in just one month oh, wow. um so it was like it was exciting and it was fun to to see that type of growth and think about that people that are listening to the show and how their lives are getting impact from 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 the content that we're producing it was great but still yet i still i'm not gonna lie to you shelby i still get the the doubtful feelings at times i'm dead serious where it doesn't last as long anymore and i've learned to harness the the nervousness but and and a team now we have one two three um four members on our team um, that help with production and different parts of our business. So four individual um, that we are helping with their household income. And the first thing, when I first started it, when we first started making a little money, my wife was like, you need to make a, you know, make X amount of dollars. I think our rent at the time was like um, a little bit over a thousand, um, $1,300. Like you need to make, a, you need to get, bring a thousand dollars to the table every month. Yeah. Um, we can do that. That'd be cool. Let's, let's see where we can start taking care of some of the basic uh, with your stuff. Um, just for the podcast. And we were, had a full-time gig and we had savings and I was you know, in sales, so I was getting commission. But anyways, seeing that now to where we are and how it's paying my salary and, and all this other stuff that's coming from this podcast now, why would I still have that nervousness? Why would I still have that worry? 
because I guess you've seen where it started right. and it came from nothing. And it's like, you know, there's an opportunity that we could eventually not get something, but you, you, I battle that. Yeah. I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm being vulnerable. I battle that. So it pushes me to make sure I need to keep, um, you know, food on the table for myself and to help these other individuals that depend on our business. Um, and also to help the sellers who are listening to our content. It, it, it gives me that, it gives me that motivation. It gives me the guidance. Um, so when I think about those weak moments and think about, can I do this or no one's going to want to listen, or, you know, we can't get the podcast to this level. I look and say, shut up and just see where you came from. Right. Look and see what you have right now. Be grateful for that and look and think about the individuals you're doing this for and that gives me helps me to overcome those obstacles for someone who's not there, and i'm not saying this stuff to brag i'm just saying this to just no, put context yeah. like how i still find myself falling in that category and i have to realize that it goes back to what am i do why am i doing this and it's to it's to have fun and to help people and once i can do that it makes me get up and and go uh, my days start typically around anywhere from about 4 30 to 5 30 and it, you know it it goes and, and I, I love it and it's exciting and I block time for my family and things like that as well. Yeah. That's how I overcome it. That's encouraging to hear that that authenticity and because that vulnerability is important. And and you said this, the the nervousness. I've I've heard it said before, the moment that the nervousness goes away, uh, you might have a problem because that means you don't care anymore. That you you're not mm -hmm. you're not pushing yourself anymore. That it's just, that it's too easy. That you're not challenging yourself. So I love that. Um, I, I love that that you you share that and that you're able to to see kind of that the struggle is often the the triumph. The struggle is real. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, as we start to wrap up, I've got just a, a couple of kind of rapid fire questions for you. So you ready? Sure. All right. I'm I'm ready All for right. it. What's the very best piece of advice you've ever gotten? Ooh, very best piece of advice I've ever gotten is I think it, it goes back to my mom. Um, it's on the back of my business card, but the advice uh, I give her credit for it. But you can do anything you want to do, um, and that that just gives me it, it gives me motivation yeah. to you know to make it happen. Anything I want to do, I can do it. Um, just make it happen. Right. What's the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten? Oh my goodness. Um, you're a great salesperson. Uh, you should you, you should go into sales and people would say, you know, you have this outgoing personality. You should sign up for sales. I'm um, going to sales. And, and it was a, str a struggle in the beginning until I, like I told you, until I got proper training. Yeah. Um, but just being a, a, just saying you have a great uh, a voice or uh, I mean, it's still a great sales personality doesn't make you um, an effective seller, you really need to bring more to the table. You got to put in the work, right? Yeah. Uh, what movie can you quote by heart? I would tie it back to uh, probably the Goonies. Uh, ah, I love it. <laughs> um, and uh, the, one of the reasons why I, I like that uh, movie is just because of the idea of the adventure. Uh -huh. You know, we could go on. Um, you can create adventure and everyone comes in all shapes and sizes. And sometimes we have to, uh, life give us opportunity to alter the way that we view um, view of the people um, and the enemy sometimes could be our friend. I mean, there's so many lessons and so many things, but anyways, yeah. Whole, and goodies never say episode. die. Never. <laughs> and finally kind of looping back to the theme of, of the show, I mean, about uh, success and, and the, the traits and secrets that, that somebody builds, what would you say your secret to success in life has been? The secret to success in life for me on a spiritual level is recognizing my my true center, and that's my my faith uh -huh. is uh, strong. Uh, I'm a big uh, believer in in God and and that you know that idea. So that that if I if I do good to others and try to make the world better around me um, and do it for a higher purpose, you know things will always turn around for my good. So that's probably one of the best, um, I guess, the source or a thing that keeps me centered the most. Um, and then the other thing I would say is my family and legacy. Um, I want it when it's all said and done, Shelby. I don't want it to say, well, Donald was, uh, he made success or he was, uh, you know, wealthy or he had a great podcast. I want my, to be, my kids to be able to say he was a great dad. Um, and my, my my wife to say it was a, you know the best husband in the world. That's what I want um, for my grandkids to say. You know, GP was awesome. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these are the reasons why he was awesome. That's what I want. 
Donald, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, it was a pleasure, Shelby. Thank you so much for having me on the show. 